Thank you, Alexei. And thank you, Amori, for this first round of presentations. Let me seize the opportunity to move on to the next presentation, which will be in a round table fashion. We'll be talking about what it means to move on to spreading Frogan's technology when you're at OP3 FT as a developer, and the chief of technical specs, a legal expert, or in charge of promotion. What does it mean? to switch to the spread of Rogan's technology. My colleagues, Benjamin, Veronique, and Dylan, can you please come up here on the podium, please? Please be seated, make yourself comfortable. Alexandre is putting in names before you so that we can easily identify you in this internet ecosystem and more specifically for people watching us online because you need to remember that we are available on the internet online. So who are our three speakers? What are they going to talk about? You've seen Frogan's sites. And very quickly, you've realized that behind that, there was a language called FSDL. So this language is being developed at the moment and being finalized. And obviously, dissemination has many consequences regarding this language. So we have three people responsible for FSDL. They're going to talk about it. So Benjamin Fista, he is in charge of specs. He will tell us what a spec is for those of you who have not heard him already during our previous conferences. Then we have Véronique Dejeu, she is in charge of software development and she is in charge of R&D. Uh, and Dylan, Dylan, can't see you Dylan. Hello. So Dylan is deputy project de leader. He joined us very recently, and he started uh, working on FSDL. And it's his birthday today, so happy birthday, Dylan. Ladies and gentlemen, you have the floor. I'm just showing your presentation. Benjamin, you have the remote. It's... Over to you now. Hello, good evening, everyone. I'm delighted I'm with you tonight to talk about this shift to the spreading of the Frogan's technology. We've had the background, and at the moment, Véronique, Dylan and I are going to try and talk about the FSDL language, which has been under development for quite a while with various phases. We have achieved the 3.0 version, so that's increasingly mature and powerful. And we are currently locking in this version. We will soon freeze the structure of the language, the 3.0 version won't evolve anymore. It will be frozen. And this is the version that will be used to develop the first Frogan's sites. So this locking in phase involves quite a few things. And before I go into details and tell you more about the locking in phase, I'd like to remind you of what the FSDL language is about. I won't spend too much time on this because you had many information during conferences uh, 5, 6 and 7. We had many presentations showing the ability of the language. So this language is a language to create and publish Frogan sites on all type of platforms and devices. It's based on XML language, so it's an open, easy to read language. It's based on XML standards, 
which is quite stable and pretty well known in the world of computers. What you need to remember with FSDL is that this is a description language, not a programming language. So we describe what a Frogan site is, we tell about the graphic elements, the layers that you may have, what are the interactions a user can have with a slide, and just describing the slide in a precise way you can do many things. You don't need a script, for, like for a JavaScript, for instance, if you want to send a document on a server, or if you want to move a button, or if you want to have a pop-up. Buttons can change shape, and this is provided for directly through the language. It's easy, because it's written in XML, which has an easy syntax, We've defined 15 elements with attributes and with that you can do anything you want and then you can type, type in on the keyboard, use the keyboard to type in an FSDL slide. We also have drivers and systems that will make slide development easier for those people who don't want to be writing everything by hand. Another powerful thing is that the FSDL language makes it possible to generate dynamic sites from a server. What's a dynamic site? It's a site where the answer is generated by a request made by the user. A user on the Frogans player sends a request to the server. The server analyzes the request and generates a new page that gives a response to the request. So that's very interesting in terms of power, and that can be achieved easily with FSDL. Another key thing with uh, Frogan's technology is that it's a secured system. As we don't need any script, any JavaScript, for instance, which was commonly used to do different things, this allows making different things directly with the language, so we are not running the scripts in the player's program, so that increases security quite dramatically, because you know that many security breaches are due to the fact that the script can take over on your terminal and start displaying windows, uh, pop-up windows, and likewise, still talking about security, we adopted a policy to do what we call script parsing. So when we get an FSDL document which is sent via a server, the player validates the document, makes sure it's in the XML and FSDL format, and if there are mistakes in the FSDL language, if the document is not properly structured, the player displays an error message and stops. It's not going to try and understand what the sender meant. It says, well, it's not a valid document. I stop. I quit. So that's a way to protect users. That's a very quick reminder of what the FSDL language is about. And now I'm going to hand over to Veronique. She is an experienced developer. She was a pioneer and she developed this language with us over the last few years and she is going to tell you about the history of our language development. Hello, good evening. So OP3FT has been working on FSDL language over the last few years and we wanted to specify a language and based on this language, which was a descriptive language, we wanted to generate images and associate them properly in order to create a slide. So that was a technical job that needed to be done and quite fortunately we had previous versions of the FSDL because some work had been done over the years so we didn't start from scratch and quite fortunately a lot had been done in the past, so we carried out this work 
and then we started implementing to get a reference library and a Frogans player capable of interpreting FSDL language. Over the last year, we developed a Frogans player which is available, which can be downloaded, and which allowed a large number of developers and designers to test the FSDL language. So these testers were in-house testers. The development team carried out their own tests, obviously. But as the language allows for so many possibilities, the number of developers and website designers that worked on this over the last year made it easier for us. It helped us contribute corrections and come up with new solutions. So what's new? Well, we everything new was prevented during the, our conferences. In the fifth conference in September 2015, this really was the conference that was uh, very important for the developers team because it allowed showing a Frogans player online and show how what a Frogans site would look like in real. Back in the days, we had a Frogans player that was capable of displaying a static site which was hosted locally. Still, it made it possible to understand everything the language made available. It also allowed navigating from the buttons and check all the resources that could be created. And it also helped demonstrating how creative the language was. Then, six months later, or a bit less, in February 2016, we had sites that were hosted on remote servers, and it was possible to access these sites via our network. So we had uh, hosting solutions a bit everywhere. And for those people who wanted to check the functionalities of FSDL into greater details, we also made a library available. That's the FSDL library, so that we can interpret an FSDL document and see all the images that will be generated, final images, intermediary images. That's very precious for people who want to create a Frogan's site. Next step is also very important because this is how we develop the dynamic FSDL. That's a series of mechanisms that allow Frogan's player to send out information to a dynamic site which can be written in PHP on an HTTP server it allows analyzing information received by the Frogans player and adapt the slide that's going to be sent back according to this information. It was also an opportunity that was the um, seventh conference we had in June this year. This was the first time we had address resolution. So for the first time we had something, exa something exhaustive. You could enter a Frogan's address on a Frogan's player, a capture the slide from a dynamic or static site, uh, receive it, interpret it, and navigate from slide to slide and from site to site. What's very important is to realize that all this work was achieved thanks to people who contributed their help by testing the FSDL language these were people who were not necessarily IT developers. We had many students 
who tested the FSDL language through our Frogan's Awards or via the Night of Information that we organized in, tw in 2015, if I'm not mistaken. And also thanks to all our colleagues, legal experts, all our de developer friends who tested the FSDL language in a totally different way as compared to the development test team which uh, carried out their tests as a developer and they're dead working on things that would have never come to mind to a standard developer so thanks to them we corrected some bugs we fixed some bugs we improved the language to make it easier to understand and the latest improvement uh, are going in that direction then yet another important thing which is going to complete the locking in of the FSDL language is the emergence of constraints to help the site developer come up with a site that will be as optimized as possible that can operate on all kind of devices and it's on these rendering constraints that I'm going to hand over to Benjamin. Well, thank you very much for this, uh, Veronique, because I wanted to talk about rendering constraints. Maybe that's a new concept. The idea with these constraints is that these are rules that we define in the specification of FSDL. The objective of these rules is to make use of Frogan site easier. We want to make sure that the site can be seen on any type of terminal, whether it be a desktop, a Mac, a Windows operated device. Once you've done it on one piece of equipment, it's going to work everywhere. We also want that once the user has accessed the site on his or her terminal, we want him or her to be able to navigate without any difficulty. So we impose a certain number of rules in our language to make sure that the site is easy to use. These rendering constraints are part of a more significant part, set of constraints. We have one on tidy fishy uh, frogan sites are small and we have a maximum size for resources for a given site. We don't want to have slides that are 200 megabytes. It would be far too long to connect. We also have constraints regarding the size of the images. We don't want 2,000 pixels. This could be displayed directly on your screen, at home, on your TV, but on your tablet or your smartphone, it would make it difficult to see. So we take into account these constraints and on top of that, we have pre- and post-rendering constraints. So the first type is about the memory of terminals and processing capacity. So these constraints make sure that a Frogan site can be rendered easily and quickly on any terminal. So we look at the resources which are used, the memory which is required, the number of pixels per frame, and if it's above a certain threshold, there is an error message which is sent to the user saying, well, this site is, won't be accepted. That's a pre-rendering constraint to make sure that the site can be used on any type of device, even low-range devices which are used by many people in the world. Then you have post-rendering constraints after the Frogan's player has done its job. This is where we make sure that the slide can be read to make sure that 
the user can actually see the slide, that the slide is big enough to be seen, that users can look at buttons on the, on, on the slide, that they can size up the slide, size it down. So it's all the interaction with the user and the site needs to include a certain number of constraints which are clearly defined in the specs. And once again, if the site is not in line with these constraints, you get an error message. So here, via the language, we introduce the, an, an easy, the easy way to write the code for a site, which is an advantage for a developer, because once you've designed a site and you can display it on any device, you can be certain that it will be available on any device. You don't need, as a developer, you don't need to buy 14 devices, an iPad, an Android phone, an, an iPhone. You develop it on your device and you know that it's going to work on all possible devices because of all these embedded constraints. And this is what we do at OP3FT that's part of our objectives. We need to find the right balance between the ends of the, end, the, 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 the needs of the end user and <coughs> the proper operation of the site. So we need to give sufficient freedom so that developers can uh, develop uh, new sites. And we need to impose constraints to make sure that these sites can be operated on any devices by the end user. Over to my colleague now. <coughs> Well, the language you spoke of, I like to seize this opportunity to talk about implementation of source codes and everything we need to make sure that uh, Fergan sites are properly displayed on screen. We renew the architecture to make it more modulable, more modular, while adding new features without having to redo it all. Penalizing authors or users, we renew the use of layers, assembling layers, so that we can use less memory. Much faster processing, up to six times. Thanks to the application of pre-rendering constraints, we have saved time. As Benjamin explained, pre-rendering constraints are there to enable a good balance between users' needs and authors' creativity to make sure that both are winners. Users do not have to wait a long time for something to be downloaded because the author did not optimize the site. Also that they can browse easily to get to all features. And thanks to pre-rendering constraints, we could also save in resources, gaining up to, well, limiting the resources used up to 100 times. And in future, we'll we will increase FSDL features supported with new uh, combination modes for buttons. Also, layer reactivity within, outside of buttons, we can enable new interactions between all layers so that authors can be more and more creative. And thanks to these new implementations, we renewed the FSDL software library's API to make it easier to use, so that people can find their way around more easily drawing a parallel between sites that users see or that creators or developers set up. Thank you so much and happy birthday, by the way. To end this presentation and to talk about switching to the spread, this new release of FSDL will be the last one. It will not change. Release 3.0 will no longer change. It doesn't mean that the language will not be enriched in future. Of course, 
the language will be enhanced. But that will be for release 3.1 and subsequent releases. For that, you'll need a new release of Frogan's player to display those slides created in 3.0. All of this to help people who have already developed Frogan sites with a previous release, we'll send them a guide for upgrading so they can know what they should do. We'll also update the recap document. The recap it gives summary explanations on how to use it all. The date for the switch over to the new release is the 31st of this October, Halloween. So we are asking site authors to get ready for that change. That date is still to be confirmed. We're doing everything we can to stick to that deadline. Later on, not straight away, we'll then have the official release of FSDL 3.0. It has been, we have been preparing it for quite some time now. And that will be the end of specifications for 3.0. Be patient, though, until the specifications are complete. That's the end of our presentation. Thank you so much. Benjamin, Véronique. Merci beaucoup, Benjamin. Merci beaucoup, Véronique. Merci beaucoup, uh, Dylan. Dylan, and let me also say that the OP3FT teams, they too, are ready for switching to the spread. Véronique, thank you so much for everything you have done for FSDL. But I know you'll be moving on to new technological territories in the near future. Thank you for everything you've done for FSDL and that you'll continue to finish for FSDL. And thanks for giving, passing on the baton to the new champion of FSDL, Dylan. And your work was not only restricted to FSDL, even though it was a, a, a huge task. Those who followed the previous conferences, you explained to us how Frogan's addresses could manage over 170 languages, avoiding any confusion. You were behind that and so many other things for Frogan's project. And all of OP3FT, we wish you all the best for your future activities and enjoy testing FSDL. I'm going to shed the tear if you continue. It was a wonderful adventure, and I will never forget you. So, switching, passing on the baton, and here too we'll change the topic. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your presentation of FSDL. If you have any questions, this is the time. We'll have another round table. And of course, all the speakers can answer your questions later on. But Dabien, Matt and Young, please come and join me so that we can speak about Frogan's player. Ah, une question. Alors. Ah, there's a question here. Don't move. I'll take your question. Alexandre, oh, there's another question over there. Don't move away. Veronique, you're here with us. Wonderful. Thank you for your presentation. I may be a bit provocative, but I get the feeling that the constraints that you spoke of in the language are more or less the same thing as the 140 characters with Twitter. That will soon uh, be reaching its limits. Aren't you lagging behind with respect to a certain revolution in leaving a free, the freedom to those who develop things instead of giving them too many constraints? Well, it is true that in the user experience that we have uh, 
been able to gather over the past year, we have come to realize that site authors can make sites that use up a lot of resources, memory and CPU, because they, did, they don't optimize the design, maybe. This is why we set up these constraints. We also implemented these constraints so that the site can operate on all devices without crashing, and so that the site is always accessible by users who can rescale it, <coughs> see and access the buttons to be able to browse on all devices. These constraints may indeed seem restrictive, but in actual fact, it's always possible. And you want to go in that direction for developers to be able to design their sites in a way that they are optimized. In an example shown to us of a user, we saw that by rewriting the code properly, just by creating resources of the required and sufficient size, you could gain in performance and memory by a factor of up to 100 for memory and performance a factor that could exceed 10 times. So we thought it's a good idea. And Alexei, you may have something to add about these constraints. But anyway, we thought it was important to see to it that authors could create their sites intelligently and support them through rendering constraints. If I may add one point, rendering constraints are not constraints linked to creativity. Very often you realize that developers work on powerful machines because they like powerful computers without realizing that their work will then be viewed on far less uh, powerful equipment. So they often design sites that are far too heavy for mobile devices, and they often make objects that are good for their computer, but not for web users. So here the constraints, as Veronique said, they don't prevent them from doing the same thing exactly. It's just, it's just that they use it, but using resources more reasonably, or using bandwidth more reasonably. That's the first point. That was for the pre-rendering constraints that Benjamin spoke of, a way to prevent developers from doing things that are pointless, and that you can't even see, they have no visual impact. Secondly, regarding usability. We have come to realize, and uh, if you were a member, you're a member of the jury, a member of the last uh, Frogan's award, and there were sites that could not be transferred because developers put buttons as big as the site. We're trying to avoid that, because a normal person who doesn't realize that you have keyboard shortcuts to manage, well, they can, can no longer switch the site to their screen. So we want to force authors to reserve some site on their site so that we can move it on the screen. It's just to keep that balance between publishers and web users to avoid sites being totally invisible, for example. It could be interesting to stumble on an invisible site, but I don't know it's open on my screen, and that could be a problem in terms of my privacy. I'd like to add one thing. What you're saying is not that you set up constraints, but that you force developers to follow certain rules to improve rendering for users. If I were you, when it comes to communication, if I may say so, I wouldn't call them constraints, because constraints, that's negative. You're doing something that's totally positive for the end user. So try to explain it using a positive term, and I think that would help. And it would be better better for the future of technology, too. If you talk about constraints, I don't want them. No, I have an obligation for the elements to run. 
using resources properly. I have a second question, if I may. So it runs on different devices. Now, will the user experience be the same on all devices? Thank you. Maybe the next group could uh, come on stage, and I think they'll be talking about that, because they are the ones who were talking about mobile devices and difference between mobile devices and uh, a pointing device, a mouse. Your comment, too, on how to name constraints. I think that's a good comment, indeed. Luckily, Benjamin hasn't finalized the specs entirely. It was just in time. Thank you, in a way.